it's, it's better than sessions. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, switching gears yet again. The last session that I'll do, and please hold your applause at, at the last session, uh, has to do with serpentine beings, watchers, and the netherworld in the religion of ancient Israel, Judaism, and Mesopotamia. The subtitle, eh, kind of misleading here, but eh, sort of to the point. What Zechariah Sitchin isn't telling you about the Anunnaki. Now, I, I'm going to have to translate this a little bit for you. What I'm going to do in this session is I want to go through uh, some passages in uh, the Hebrew Bible that deal with serpentine beings, also known as watchers, uh, mostly in, in, in the literature of Middle Judaism, and also the netherworld, and then sort of, sort of create a, a description of you know, who these beings are, what they do, where they live, you know, that kind of thing. And then ask the question, is there any evidence, is there any, any uh, suggestion that the Anunnaki of Mesopotamian texts match this description? I can preview it this much for you. There, there are a number of overlaps. They're, they're not, um, there are some gaps, let's put it that way, but there are a number of overlaps. So this is just kind of an exploratory uh, session just to uh, compel your thinking a little bit in this direction. Uh, because, frankly, when it comes to the Anunnaki, there are things that, that Sitchin does not go into that I think uh, robs you, the reader, and, and the thinker, the researcher, of the complete picture. Let's see. So some preliminary thoughts. Again, as the title suggests, there's more to this than you might have heard. I'm not going to worry about dealing with uh, some you know, errors that Sitchin makes in, in, in some of his statements. That is the Sitchin overview session. So we're not going to worry too much about that. Rather, the third point here, the focus is discerning several noteworthy overlaps between the watchers of biblical theology and later Judaism and the Anunnaki. And again, I'm admitting that there are differences between the, the groups, but there are some pretty noteworthy similarities too. Now, toward drawing attention to these, uh, this is the order I'm going to follow, and hopefully it will be coherent for you. We want to talk, actually review, since, since most of you have probably uh, heard my session on uh, Genesis 3 and Genesis 6, where we talked about the Nakash, the serpent, a little bit. But we'll, we'll go through that. Then we'll take a look at serpentine beings elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible. Again, note the sons of God and the watchers, the relationship between Genesis 3 and 6, and descriptions of the Anunnaki. Now, this session obviously has some overlap with other sessions, but again, to get it all in one session is, is our strategy here, is the goal. Uh, again, Genesis 3 is the biblical account of the fall. Now, the serpent, Hanakash in Hebrew, the Nakash is the terminology I'm going to use, was the shrewdest of all the wild beasts that the Lord God had made. He says to the woman, did, you really, did God really say you should not eat of any tree of the garden? The woman replied to the Nakash, we may eat of the fruit of the other trees of the garden. It's only the tree of life in the middle of the garden that God said you shall not eat of it or touch it lest you die. Which is kind of ironic because elsewhere in the Old Testament, God wants uh, humanity to have eternal life. But here, uh, you know, it, it's clear that he doesn't want them to... Um, you know, do certain things and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there's, there's this debate about, you know, is, is God being mean here or whatever? We're not necessarily going to rabbit trail into that, but the, both ideas are actually present in the Old Testament. But uh, restricting ourselves to this passage for the moment. And then Nakash said to the woman, you're not going to die, but God knows that as soon as you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like divine beings who know good and evil, or good and bad. The Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? This is after she eats. The woman replied, the Nakash duped me and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the Nakash, because you did this, you're going to be cursed more than all the cattle, beasts, and so on and so forth. And then he says in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring or your seed and her offspring or her seed. And I made the comment before that you can take this as a personal he, third masculine, or impersonal it will strike at your head and you shall strike at his or its heel. And that depends upon how you think the prophecy gets played out in the New Testament. Observations. You can probably tell again by this time that I don't think the Nakash was a snake. Uh, 
There's no indication that animals had the gift of speech in Eden. The fact that Eve was not surprised when the Nakash spoke to her must be explained exegetically, not by speculation. Uh, you know, I, I've read all sorts of things here that, uh, you know, we have some sort of weird animal then that we don't have now, and it had legs, and it stood upright, and it talked, you know, or animals could talk back then. The text doesn't say any of that. The two parallel passages, as we shall see momentarily, to the fall in the Garden of Eden require, that's a strong word, but I'm going to use it, require that the Nakash be viewed as a divine being and not a snake. Now, where we're going to go here is that you have, you're dealing with a divine being that had some sort of serpentine or reptilian appearance. It was also luminous, very intelligent, very beautiful at the same time. So can this idea that the Nakash is a divine being and not a snake be established in the text here? And does that rule out a serpentine appearance for the Nakash? And the second one I've already played my hand. At, no, uh, it doesn't. But again, the word itself, three consonants in Hebrew, the nun, chet, and shin, nakash, can function as a noun, verb, or adjective in the Hebrew Bible. If you take it as a noun in meaning, it would just be translated serpent. Again, perfectly workable, as we've mentioned before. If you take it verbally, it was with its verbal meaning, the word would be translated deceiver or diviner. Again, the practicing of divination, the act of uh, deception, perfectly workable. But I'm suggesting that we ought to take it because of two other passages we're going to go to today. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to triangulate them and, and see them consistently together. That's the reason I'm saying that if we take it as an adjective, the word would mean shining one because nachash as an adjective when it's used uh, to describe you know, nouns, objects, it means to shine or to be brilliant or luminous or something like that. We get the, there's the Hebrew word nekoshet. Okay, you just add the T to the end to form the noun. It means polished brass, burnished brass. So again, the, the shiny effect. Interbiblical parallels, I think, establish this. And I take it this way primarily because of parallel passages to the fall. Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, where a brilliant, shining, angelic, or divine being is cast out of Eden. Neither of these passages have a snake in the story, and the context of each passage with Genesis 3 is the meeting place of the divine council. What I'm saying here is that Genesis 3, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, these are the three passages in the Old Testament that deal with what happened in Eden. All three of them take place in the location where the Divine Council meets, and there are certain motifs that we're going to go into today that establish that fact. And also, all three of those passages need to, in my mind anyway, need to, be, need to cohere together. And two of them don't have a snake, and I'm suggesting the one that appears to, we might want to just translate that word as shining one instead of serpent to, again, make them fit together, to have them cohere. So first, considering the context of the three passages before getting into the specific parallels. Again, the divine council, if this is new to you, in as brief a definition as possible, is a concept known throughout the ancient Near East. For instance, it's mentioned in Enuma Elish and Atrahasis with the Anunnaki. It's very plainly said, the Anunnaki of the great divine assembly said this and that. You know, four or five times in that story that the divine council, the divine assembly is mentioned. It is the high god or gods and their bureaucratic entourage, the heavenly host of which angels are merely one member category. In all ancient Mediterranean religions, including Israel, the council met at specific places, usually the abode of the high god. And although there are council parallels between the Hebrew Bible and cuneiform sources, the most explicit parallels are between the Hebrew Bible and its near its closest geographical and linguistic neighbor, ancient Ugarit, which is ancient Syria. Uh, Ugaritic, by the way, if, if you like languages, if you, you want to study these someday, Ugaritic is the closest language linguistically to biblical Hebrew. Uh, there are a number of words in the Hebrew Bible. They're, they're called hapax legomena. That, that's a fancy way of saying words that only show up one time. And you've heard me saying that meaning is determined by context. Well, if you only have a word that shows up one time, how do you really know 
what it means because you don't have anything to compare it to. Well, when the Ugaritic tablets were discovered, a lot of those words that only show up one time in the Hebrew Bible were in that language, consonant for consonant. And so Semitic linguists looked at that and said, boy, this, this will really give us some help here because there's such a close language overlap here between the two. So it's, it's been very useful. And it, it's especially useful in, in parallels of this kind. So the second thought here, the relationships are actually so close between the two literatures and their religions that one of the names of the God of Israel, El, that's from the Hebrew Bible, was also the name of the high God of Agard. They were both El. El's vizier, or his vice regent, who was called the ruler of the gods, was Baal. That's a, that's a title he gets. This proximity and terminology was one reason why Baal was the chief nemesis of Israel's prophets. Uh, Israel also had a, uh, a second power in heaven, a second god, if you will, a second vizier uh, in the Old Testament. I don't want to rabbit trail too much, but this is, this is my dissertation, and I like to talk about my dissertation, even though it was such a, such a point of suffering in my life for so many years. Uh, but it actually has value. Um, no, what happened was, in, in Israelite religion, in the Israelite version of the council, you can't have Yahweh and another god separate from Yahweh ruling the cosmos. So what the Israelites did, which was really kind of neat, kind of clever, was they said, the second person is Yahweh's essence manifested in a different form. So you don't have Yahweh competing with another god. You have Yahweh and then his essence manifested differently. The most, the, you know, there are some real plain examples. Uh, the name, uh, th that word, the phrase, the name, You'll, there are passages in the Old Testament where the name does this, the name does that, the name goes out to battle. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of euphemistic, but the, the technically correct term is that this is a hypostasis of Yahweh. It's Yahweh's essence manifested separate from him. It is him, but it isn't. This is the basis. It's the basis, it's the beginning point for binitarianism in Jewish thought. Now later the spirit of God is gonna be spoken in the same way, that's where we get Trinitarianism. It's actually Jewish, I mean, it's not something the Christians invented. Uh, it's well known in Middle Judaism. Uh, the, the Malach Adonai, the angel of the Lord, God says, this angel is different than all the other ones because my name is in him. Okay, my essence is in him and that's why the angel of the Lord and Yahweh are interchangeable in a number of passages. Because he is Yahweh, but he kind of isn't. He is and he isn't. Uh, it's, it's that sort of difficult binitarian, trinitarian problem that we look back at in theology and struggle with. But by the way, hypostasis was also a common um, institution in other religions of the ancient Near East, uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, each god had, had one or a couple hypostases. Uh, but in Israel, it was the consistent pattern in the council. But anyway, let's take a look at the Council of El to get an idea of how close the council ideas are between the two religions, because this is the point today. Because I'm gonna to try to establish that Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, and Genesis 3 are divine council settings. Now, at Ugarit, the location of the meeting place of the divine council went by these descriptions. At the source of the two rivers, in the midst of the double deep fountain, this, again, this is, these are the places where heaven and earth meet. Mount Safanu, that was Baal's mountain. The Mount of Assembled Council, and again, there were a variety of sacred mountains that are mentioned as where the council shows up and has a meeting. Now, you'll notice Safanu and this Pukru Mo'ed, if you go to the biblical side, you have some, some conceptual parallels here, and here you have direct linguistic parallels. Zion and Eden are well watered. You might think, well, there's four rivers in the description of the Garden of Eden. Uh, what you should do is you should go back and get a good exegetical commentary there because it, it, it can be coherently argued that the names are interchanged there and you actually only have two, but I'm not gonna rabbit trail there. Uh, Zion and Eden, again, where God lives is Mount Zion, where the temple was, are described as well-watered. and you, know, you get this watery language here in these passages. 
Uh, let's go down here. Mount, Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai. Again, God lives on a mountain in Israelite religion. It's very familiar. And Eden is called the mountain of God and the garden of God in Ezekiel 28. You actually have Eden called a mountain. But back here, Zion is called the heights of Tzaphon in Isaiah 40, or Psalm 48, 2 and Isaiah 14. It's exactly the same term, Tzaphon, Tzaphanu. The vowels are different because Ugaritic is a different language. They use different vowels. Mount of Assembly, Isaiah 14. Look at the passages, Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28. Okay. The Har Moed, the Mount of Assembly. By the way, this is free. I wish I would have put this up here on, on, uh, in the PowerPoint itself. In, uh, if you were to turn, you see this little kind of backward parentheses here? That is a letter in Hebrew that we don't have in English. It's a r. That's how you, you pronounce it. The Greeks didn't have it either. They don't know what a r is. <laughs> so what they did was, well, what's the closest letter to that? It's a Hebrew term, and when it was a Hebrew term, they would just transliterate it. They just put the letters in. And they decided, well, a, a, a G, duh, sounds like r. And so like Gomorrah is spelled with one of these in the front. It's actually Gomorrah. Okay, so the Greeks put a G, Gomorrah. Well, why do I say this? Because if you put a G here, you have H, take the vowels out, H, R, M, G, D. Okay? You go to the book of Revelation when the word Armageddon is used. John specifically says, this is in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. In the Hebrew, that would be Har. Moed, the N is actually a place name consonant that is very common for geographical words. What I'm suggesting is the Battle of Armageddon is actually a battle on Mount Zion because it is the Battle of the Mount of Assembly. It's the war, as the Qumranites put in the War Scroll, it's the war of gods and men. Uh, read the War Scroll sometime, then go read the Book of Revelation. It's kind of shocking. But anyway, that's a little off the beaten path. Description of the Divine Council meeting place. Continuing here. In, at El's house, El's abode, decrees were issued from the tents of El. This is Vad Il in the Ugaritic. El and the gods lived in tents, Ohalim, and tabernacles, Mishkanot. El's abode is a dwelling, Methav and Mazillel the shelter. El and the council meet in a house, temple. Baal's palace had paved bricks and a court and stones like lapis lazuli. If you look over here, it's, I mean, the, the, the parallels are just kind of amazing. Yahweh lives in a tent, same consonants. Okay, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, it's the same thing. The pavilion, the dwelling, again, the conceptual parallel. These are exact exact terms, the bait, the house, the heikal, the hakalim. Okay. In, his, in Exodus 24, Yahweh's abode is described uh, with a courtyard, same word, katser, made of bricks, levanot. And if you actually read Exodus 24, the pavement was like sapphire. Okay. Same thing here. Um, the, the language is very tight. Now, I, I showed you that as preparatory to this. When you look at these three passages, what you've got going on are divine council scenes. So what, what happens is something happens in the council, some, some sort of uh, event or rebellion uh, you know, associated with the, the fall of a divine being and also the corruption of humanity. So both passages in these two, we'll go back to Genesis 3 in a moment, are not about divine beings per se, but about evil tyrant kings. You'll read this in commentaries, and that's true. What's going on here? is that the prophets are railing against, in one case, the king of Tyre, in another case, the king of Babylon. They're just going off on them, telling them how bad they are. And, and they both get the idea, I'll show you how bad you are. I'm going to compare you, foreign king, you wicked king, to a tale about a divine being who fell from paradise in rebellion against God. I'm going to illustrate your arrogance by comparing you to this being. And that's what they do in these passages. Let's go over here. Let's take a look at them. Ezekiel 28. 
the word of the Lord came to me, O mortal, O human one, O son of man, literally, intone a dirge over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom and flawless and beauty. You were in Eden. Now we know the king of Tyre was not in Eden, so he's describing the king of Tyre with, in light of this story for the sake of illustrating his arrogance. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your adornment, and he lists them. I created you as a cherub with outstretched shielding wings, and you resided on God's holy mountain. So he's in Eden, God's holy mountain. You walked among stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until wrongdoing was found in you. By your far-flung commerce, you were filled with lawlessness and you sinned. And he starts going off on him again. So I have struck you down from the mountain of God. I have destroyed you, O shielding cherub, from among the stones of fire. You grew haughty because of your beauty. You debased your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I have cast you to the ground. I've made you an object for kings to stare at. Isaiah 14, you're going to see a lot of similarities. Here the rant is against the king of Babylon. He's such a tyrant and such a jerk. And so Isaiah says, Sheol below was a stir to greet your coming. When you think you're something special, well, that's where you're going to end up. Rousing for you the Rephaim of all earth's chieftains, rise, raising from their thrones. The Rephaim are on thrones in Sheol. Remember that. Raising from your thrones all the kings, Hebrew, the Moloch, M-L-K-M, it's not Malachim, angels, it's different spelling there. There's no Aleph here. All speak up and say to you, so you have been stricken as we were. You've become like one of us. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol. And the strains of your lutes, worms are to be your bed and maggots your blanket. By the way, that's a real good description of the Mesopotamian underworld. How are you fallen from heaven, O shining one, son of the dawn, shining one, son of the dawn? How are you cast down to earth, O vanquisher of nations? Once you thought in your heart, I will mount to the heavens. I will mount to the heavens. Higher than the stars of God will I set my throne. I will sit in the mount of assembly on the summit of Zaphon. Your English Bibles will say north. North is Zaphon. Why? Because that's where the mountain of El was in the north, the geographic north. I will mount the back of a cloud. Yahweh's title, Baal's title, the cloud rider. I will match the most high. Instead, you are brought down to Sheol, to the bottom of the pit. Now, parallels. Let's take a look at some of this in a, in a parallel structure. Genesis 3, I'm suggesting Nakash means shining one. Shining ones in the Garden of Eden, where God walked. Okay. Here we have descriptions of the being. He's described with luminous, brilliant stones, brightness. Again, these stones are the same things that describe the brightness of God's throne, so it's pretty bright. Uh, we have here, again, this description as the anointed cherub. Now, that assumes that the word anointed is the correct translation of the Hebrew mashach. Now, that's possible. It's a common term. We get Messiah from it, Mashiach, the anointed one. However, if you remember back to English class, and please don't shudder, if you remember what a homonym is, Semitic languages have homonyms too, words that are spelled the same but mean something different. There is also a Hebrew mashach, which means, guess what, to shine. So this could very well be translated, and I'm suggesting it should be. I created you as a shining cherub. Shining cherub, shining one, and here it's point blank. Isaiah 14, O shining one. The Hebrew is Halel ben Shekhar. This is where, by the way, uh, we get our word Lucifer from, because when the, the, the text was translated into Latin, the word for shining one, Halel, in Latin is Lucifer. Okay, shining one just means something luminous. Nakash here, again, can still carry its other two meanings, a serpentine and deceiver. And I think serpentine is important because here, this is really kind of interesting. You had this odd phrase back in Ezekiel 28, you were the seal of perfection. 
And commentators usually say, well, that just means, you know, you, it's kind of a uh, sort of a description, an embellishment to show how, you know, wonderful and beautiful this king thought he was. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that's not possible, but what's really interesting is if you transliterate the Hebrew for seal of perfection, kotem tachnit, if you put it into transliterated letters, this is an interesting term because at times in Semitic languages, the M here is silent, like we have silent E. And if that's the case here, what you have here is that this phrase, exact same phrase, means skillful serpent because this word, chet, vav, tav, with silent M, means serpent in Canaanite. It's just one of the generic words for serpent. So you could have, I created you as a shining cherub and a skillful serpent. Shining serpentine being. Some more. Genesis 3. He was in Eden. He knew that when Adam and Eve ate, they would become like, I should be one, sorry about that, one of the gods. And again, Eden was the place of the council. You go over to Ezekiel 28. It's point blank. Eden is the mountain of God and a garden as well. He walks among the stones of fire, but was thrown out of heaven, the place of the stars. Now that is interesting. He gets thrown out of heaven, and that helps inform us what stones of fire are. Stones of fire are considered by experts in ancient Israelite and Near Eastern religion to be either planets or stars, which of course for the sake of this conference is really interesting, really cool. And divine beings were considered celestial objects or, or perhaps it goes either way. Uh, stars to the ancient person were either divine beings themselves or they were inhabited by divine beings. You know, it, it varies, but you, you'll see both. The stars of God, in Isaiah 14, 13, and at Ugarit, and in Job 38. The stars of God, anybody remember Job 38 from a night or two ago? Where were you, Job, when I set the foundations of the earth? When the stars of of heaven, the stars of God, the sons of God shouted for joy, the morning stars. Stars of God are divine beings. They're members of the council. They're Elohim. They're the B'nai Elohim in Job 38. Again, we have the shining one here. He wanted to set his throne on the mountain of God. Mountain, mountain, Eden is a mountain here. On the mountain of assembly, the place where the council meets, above the stars of God. What he's saying is, I want to be supreme, and I'm going to be supreme in council. I'm going to kick El off the throne, and I am going to subsume that position. I will be like the Most High. I will be above all other gods, above the stars of El. I will supervise the Mount of Assembly. I, 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 and so on and so forth. And again, this phrase, the mountain of God, is the summit of Tzaphon, which we've already seen has parallels for the divine council. The Kash, again, serpentine, seal of perfection, and whatnot up here. Going again here, if you look at, again, the rest, the, the passage in a fuller sense, you might say, well, what about the curses? You know, I get this question a lot, frankly, where... You know, how can you take the, the, the serpent in Genesis 3 as a divine being? I mean, after all, he gets punished. You know, he, he gets, he, he's made to crawl on his belly. And that sure looks like you have an animal that now, you know, the, his legs are taken away and he becomes a snake and so on and so forth. Okay, here's my suggestion to you. Interpret this curse by virtue of these two. Now watch, we're going to start with these two. I have struck you down from the mountain of God, destroyed you from the, among the stones of fire, I've, I've kicked you out, kicked you out of the council, kicked you out of heaven. I have cast you to the ground. It's a critical word. It's arts in Ugaritic. Notice the consonants. There's that parentheses, the R, and then the S with a dot. We would point it, we would say arts in Ugaritic, eretz in Hebrew. It's a generic word in the Hebrew Bible for earth or ground. In Canaanite dialects, though, it means the netherworld. The arets is Sheol. It's, it's, a, it's a synonym for Sheol. It's the place of the dead. I have made you an object for kings to stare at. So in Ezekiel 28, the divine being gets kicked out of the council. 
he gets kicked out of heaven, so to speak, the place where the gods meet, the, the realm of the gods. Let's put it that way. He gets kicked out of the realm of the gods, and he gets sent to the lower realm, the realm of the dead, the realm in Sheol, the netherworld, the arts. Isaiah 14, Sheol below was a stir to greet you as you come. I mean, right point blank, that's where he ends up. Rousing for you the Raphaim who, quote unquote, live there. You're brought down to Sheol. How have, are you fallen from heaven, O shining one, son of the dawn? You're cast down to the earth, to the arts. It's the same word in the text. You're brought down to Sheol, to the bottom of the pit, and they peer at you closely. As a side here, Job 26 says, the Rephaim tremble beneath the waters and their denizens. Sheol is naked before him. Abaddon has no cover. Rephaim, Sheol, Abaddon. We're going to come back to these terms. If you were here for the Ezekiel presentation, I'm going to show you this in this presentation, but just to prep you, I had a, a graphic of what the ancient Near Eastern conception of the world was, and you had a flat earth, you had the dome overwards, and then underneath you had Sheol. Okay. Lucifer the Shining One starts up here. He wants to be at the very top of the council. God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to cast you down to the arts, earth and arts, underworld. If, if there's a word play, it's a double entendre here. This is why Satan, in later theology, is the god of the world, the god of the earth, and he's also the god of hell, the leader of hell, because of the word play here. Point of comparisons. The three texts describe a divine being who was a member of the council, but who was kicked out. He also has a serpentine appearance. So again, he's, there's a demotion here. There's a serpentine appearance. He's cast down to the ground, again, the netherworld in Canaanite mythology. He's under the earth in Israelite and Canaanite cosmology. Again, later when you get to the Satan in Job, this being, the shining one, is said to run to and fro throughout the earth. To accuse people before the Lord is called the God of this world by Paul. Going back here, again, to the curse. Serpents don't eat real dirt. They don't eat dirt at all. And not all women and humans fear them. I don't think that the curses should be taken literally. I think they should be taken, pardon the term, mythologically or metaphorically. The point is that the Nakash is cast down to the ground, just like he is here. And what that means is, just as it means here and here, that the Nakash, the Shining One, is sent down to the human realm to rule and affect and interact with humans. He's kicked out of the divine realm, and now he rules hell, he rules Sheol. That's exactly what the point of the curse is here. If you take it literally, then you have to, have, you have to explain why snakes don't eat dirt and why all humans aren't afraid of them. If you take my suggestion, those aren't issues. But again, it's just my suggestion. By the time Isaiah and Ezekiel wrote, Sheol was associated with dead giants, the Rephaim, whose spirits were alive in the netherworld. Again, if you missed the session on Genesis 6, it's a word for giant, for, for you know, one of the giant clans. Isaiah 14, Job 26, and other places. Ezekiel 32 is another one. I didn't put that up here. Have these guys, just like Enoch does, residing in the pit. Additional note, it is interesting to note that in the Gilgamesh epic, Tablet 11, a snake steals the immortality of humanity, line 283, after which Gilgamesh laments that the, this is a, is a really weird phrase in Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh laments that the earth lion in Akkadian Neshu Shah Kakari had stolen his chance at eternal life. What in the world is going on here? Why? The story has a snake, it's Bitsru here, and when Gilgamesh is sitting down feeling sorry for himself, he refers to this thing as an, an earth lion. Well, what the heck is that? Earth lion is the same way that Greek expresses the word for chameleon. Kamai leon. Kamai is on the ground, on the earth. Leon, lion, earth lion. That's what chameleon literally means. Noted cuneiform scholar Ake Joburg has suggested, and it's just a suggestion, but I think it's worth thinking about, it may be possible to connect Akkadian Neshu with the Eblaite Naish, and that word with the Hebrew Nakash. Now, why do I bring this up? Because Neshu, 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 
okay, nachash. And what that leads to is the significance of this possible connection is that one would have a serpentine being in an Eden-like story who was a changeling. Chameleons change their appearance, don't they? This might resonate with 1st Enoch 19.1, where the watchers were said to be able to change form, and perhaps 2 Corinthians 11.14, this is the verse where it talks about Satan being able to tran be transformed into an angel of light. Uh, he can appear uh, as something brilliant and wonderful when he actually is not. The identity, we talked about this, that was our first point, identity, nature, and fate of the serpent. Let's talk about serpentine beings elsewhere besides the one we, we think of cash in the garden. Some tentative comments and speculations, and again, I'm, I'm deliberately saying this because, I, quite frankly, I'm still thinking about some of this. I don't know quite what to make of it. Trust me, folks, this is, you know, pardon the expression, virgin territory. It's not like I can go look up a commentary or go ask some scholar to think in these terms. It's not going to happen. And so, you know, I, I'm still cogitating on, on a good bit of this. The reference to the shining being in the Garden of Ezekiel as a shining anointed cherub is interesting, but rarely received, it's rarely received much thought since scholars assume that cherubim and seraphim are different. Many scholars assume that seraphim means burning ones from Hebrew saraf, that cherubim are sphinx-like creatures based on ancient Near Eastern divine throne iconography. Now, if you were here with the Ezekiel session, you know that there's a lot of cherubim that look like sphinx-type creatures. You know, that, that's, that's true. Now the question is, is that all they are? Is that only what they are in the Semitic mind? Now, I think all the assumptions are open to question, and some observations might come, uh, come to fruition here, or at least contribute. The relationship of cherubim and seraphim is uncertain. If one removes the four-faced cherubim from the category, and you know my view now that I don't think the point is literal cherubim, I think the point is the four faces of the zodiac. So if you, if you accept that and accept, E-X-C-E-P-T, the two-faced cherubim of Ezekiel, which again, if Flynn is correct, that's also precessional. If you exclude the processional stuff, then cherubim normally described elsewhere are simply winged creatures. On occasion, the description of a cherub includes features that are not in the iconography of the ancient world, such as the hands of a man, but which are shared with seraphim. Here I'm suggesting maybe there's a relationship between cherubim and seraphim. Again, it's possible, I'm still thinking about it. The function of both could be called guardianship of the council or the throne of God. Seraphim, of course, are the ones that guard the throne in Isaiah 6. Genesis 3.24, after Adam uh, is driven out of the garden, God places a flaming uh, a seraph, a seraphim, uh, there at the, at the entrance to the garden. And then, of course, Ezekiel 28, uh, taking Meshach, again, as shining. Uh, you might have one there, too. So seraphim are quite likely serpentine. The, ser the term seraph is interchanged with nakash, same word, serpent in the garden, the shining one, in the account of Moses and the serpents that bite is the Israelites in Numbers 21. But what I'm going, just going through is what we, what we do know here. In, in this story, in Numbers 21, the children of Israel are going through the desert and they, and to, to punish them, uh, again, for, for grumbling and murmuring after they've been delivered by the, at the Red Sea and a, and a few other kind of amazing deliverances, God says, you know, the people are grumbling, again, despite the fact that I've done these amazing things for them. And he sends serpents to that, that bite the Israelites. The serpents in that account are called both. They go by both terms. They're called nakash and saraf. These are synonyms. Okay, we know what this is. A serp it can mean a serpentine thing. But most scholars say that this just means burning one. Well, guess what? While there is a root saraf to me that means to burn in Hebrew, it is equally true that there is saraf right here in Numbers 21 that's just a serpent. So what I'm suggesting here is that a seraphim might be a serpentine being. That might be what they look like. Okay, again, still thinking about this. Uh, in Egypt, seraph, uh, Egypt actually combines the features 
uh, a seraph in Egypt is a, f is a shining or flaming serpent. So they, they sort of dovetail both possibilities in Egyptian literature and Egyptian iconography. So we've talked a little bit about both of these, identity, nature, fate, and possible serpentine beings elsewhere. Sons of God and the Watchers, again, by this time you should be familiar with Genesis 6. I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but Sons of God with the Daughters of Men, bearing the Nephilim. Again, Sons of God are often called Watchers in later Jewish literature. I've uh, had these passages up before, but again, they are distinct. The Watchers come down to the earth, teach the Sons of Men, and they end up committing sins with the daughters of men because they began to mingle themselves with the daughters of men so that they might be polluted. Uh, again, we're familiar with all this. Watcher is not just a later Jewish term. It does show up in the Bible. So don't leave here and get the mistaken notion that watcher is just a, an Enochian term. It actually does show up uh, in Daniel. And it's always accompanied with the phrase holy one. So a watcher is a holy one, which you know, which means by this time in Daniel and Israelite history and theology, you have good watchers. Okay, it's, it's not the, the point is not that they're all evil. The, the ones in Genesis six are viewed as evil, but here you have three examples where they're good guys. In the vision of my mind in my bed, you know, Daniel says, "I saw a watcher that is a holy one coming down from heaven." This is when he's going to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and he gets you know. It's a, the edict passed down, the decree passed down by the watchers as to what's going to happen. The watcher, that is the holy one whom the king saw descend from the heavens, saying, so on and so forth. Here's the phrase, watcher, holy one. Daniel 4.23, sentence is decreed by the watchers. This verdict is commanded by the holy ones. This verse is really interesting because it really gives them power. Okay? The point is not that they've come up with a sentence that God doesn't know about. But the point is that they are council members, and the council has decided, in Daniel 7, you have that council meeting, that this is what's going to happen. So there's, there's some degree of participation, uh, decision-making here in the council. Uh, in the book of First Enoch and other intertestamental Jewish texts, the watchers are evil. We, we know about that. You've heard enough about that. In Second Enoch 18, the number of the fallen watchers is put at 200. That's an interesting number that we'll, we'll see later. They were sentenced to imprisonment within the earth for their corruption of human race. Again, we've seen these motifs, so I'm not going to read this whole thing for you, but they are reprimanded here. Um, down here you have, uh, From henceforth you will not ascend into heaven into all eternity, and in bonds of the earth the decree has gone forth to bind you for all the days of the world, so on and so forth. First Enoch 18, I saw a deep abyss with the columns of heavenly fire, and among them I saw columns of fire fall. This place is the end of heaven and earth. This has become a prison for the stars, okay, angelic beings, and the host of heaven. Let me go back here. Enoch, first Enoch 20, Uriel, one of the holy angels who is over the world and over Tartarus. That's really interesting. Uriel is the one who is over Tartarus, which is the place of the abyss where the watchers get sent. And here we have a reference to Gabriel, one of the holy angels who is over paradise and over the serpents mm. and the cherubim. So this appears to separate the categories. Maybe they are. Maybe this is just what we call in literature a hendiadis, which is a repetition. Other references to the place where the watchers get sent. Second Peter, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to Tartarus committed them to chains of deepest darkness, so on and so forth. The nature of their sin is somehow linked to sexual activity. We've talked about this before in this phrase in Jude, referring to the angels who did not keep their own place, left their proper dwelling. He has kept in eternal chains in deepest darkness. Again, these are Enochian phrases right in the New Testament. In some cases, they're word-for-word -word quotes. Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which in the same manner as them, indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural lust, unnatural, again, heaven and earth, serve as an example. Of course, the question, does them refer to the cities or to the angels? And grammatically, as I pointed out before, it refers to the angels because of gender number agreement. We're not going to worry about the grammar here. Let's add something else to make the mix a little more interesting. So you've got 
watchers that are bound in the abyss in Tartarus, you know, this place with deep dark chains and all that stuff. You have references to angels guarding serpents. You have uh, references to good watchers and bad ones. Uh, let's complicate things a little, a little more. Uriel said to me, here shall stand the angels who have connected themselves with women. We know who they are. And their spirits, assuming many different forms, okay, are defiling mankind and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as gods. Well, now, wait a minute. If they're in prison, who, you know, who's doing this? Who are these guys? If the watchers are in prison, what are these spirits? How can the spirits of the watchers plague humanity again when they're in prison? They're either bound or not. The punishment was pretty ineffective. Again, we're going to muddy the waters even more, and then we'll try to sort this out. But now the giants who are born from the union of the spirits and the flesh shall be called evil spirits. Their dwelling shall be upon the earth and inside the earth. Evil spirits have come out of their bodies because from the day that they were created from the holy ones, they were watchers. Now here we have Enoch calling the giants watchers, saying they're evil spirits. They live upon the earth and inside the earth. What is this? You know, what's going on here? Here's what we have in this mess. <laughs> and believe me, this is why scholars of, of uh, Jewish angelology just want to pull their hair out. You have watchers in prison in Tartarus or the abyss. You have watchers spirits that are still free to go run around the earth. These spirits can change form. You have giants follow, fathered by the spirits, the watchers, apparently referring to the original offenders of Genesis 6 who were in prison. But then you have giants themselves called watchers or evil spirits. And then you have them in the earth and on the earth. And pun intended, what in hell is going on here? Uh, <laughs> it sure looks like a messed up place. And here's my attempted explanation. Okay, hold on to your hats here. The original watchers who committed the sin of Genesis 6 are in prison according to all these texts. All the traditions, including the Greek Titan story, puts them there until the end times. Okay? That's one group. The offspring of these watchers, who were the Nephilim giants, were half watcher and half human. Thus, it is true that they are watcher from birth. Okay, at least you know, half of them, they have that line. As such, when a giant was killed by flood cannibalism, Enoch refers to this a couple times, or an archangel, only the human side died. The spirit, the watcher half, lived on as a watcher the spirit or watcher who came out of their bodies. These subsequent generation watchers were also called Shadim, the demons. And again, I've said before, this is the Jewish explanation for where demons come from. These watcher demons may be in the abyss, but they may also be upon the earth. They're not imprisoned, only the original ones are. And I have here a cross-reference to Mastema, who is the leader of the Watchers in one Enochian text. Um, this word can be linked to the word Satan, and so this might be Satan, but I'm not going to worry about that now. They are thus in the earth and upon the earth. They can assume many forms, and they want to be worshipped as gods. They solicit and receive sacrifice as gods. This is the picture of... Jewish demonology, I guess would be more fair to say. Here's the kicker. Again, one fragmentary text from Qumran, 4Q Amram, manuscript B, tells us that watchers had a serpentine appearance. Now here's the text. This is, a, this is fragmentary. I'm sorry this isn't very clear. I couldn't find a way. Well, actually, I couldn't, didn't have access to a good photocopier when I needed to do this, but could have enlarged it. This line here, this is the, the scroll from Qumran, it's Aramaic. You see the, the edge here where it was rolled up. This line here, the text is describing watchers. And let me just give you the, the, the context. Amram, who is the father of Moses, now we don't know from the text whether this is the father of Moses or just another guy named Amram. Uh, he, he sees two watchers fighting, essentially, over his body, over his, his person, uh, whether either, either before death or after death, or this is part of the death process, you know, like, where are you going to go? Who's going to rule over you? And he has two watchers, and one of them says to him, you know, who do you want, which one of us do you want to rule over you? Uh, that's significant because 
In the New Testament, there's actually a passage where Satan uh, and, and Michael are fighting over the body of Moses. Okay, it's a different, different situation there. People have wondered if this relates to that passage, that odd passage. But this line says that one of the watchers, his appearance was fearsome like a serpent. And this line down here says, again, in his appearance, uh, he was, let me read it here, he was like an asp. An asp, of course, is a different kind of, of serpent. This is the text transliterated here, but we're not going to take the time to, to go through it. This book, by the way, uh, the most accessible place you can find this text is in a book by Michael Wise and Robert Eisenman called The Dead Sea Scrolls Uncovered. Okay, it has a nice little couple paragraph write up on it. Problems. If watchers can be and still are good, are even the good ones serpentine naturally? I mean, is, that, is that just what they look like? Keep in mind the watchers are the sons of God. What, you know, I, I still have questions about this. What's the relationship between the watchers and the sons of God and the seraphim? And what, the, the, the texts just aren't clear on this. And if not, what's with the serpentine thing? First Enoch 20 distinguishes the original watchers in the abyss or Tartarus from the serpents. We saw this text. Okay? So there may be a distinction here. However, it's obvious that the fallen Nakash is serpentine and that he rules in the earth, the arts where the watcher demons operate. So moving on, again, I realize we're covering this rapidly. Discuss a little bit between the relationship of Genesis 3 and Genesis 6. Again, the issue is the seat of the Nakash. Are the seat of the Nakash literally the watchers in Genesis 6? We talked about this in my Genesis 6 presentation. Since we have a fall in Genesis 3 initiated by a divine being, another one Fall, another fall from grace initiated by divine beings in Genesis 6. Are they related? The problem is the biblical text never explicitly says that, but Jewish writers did connect them um, after the, uh, you know, at, at a certain point in, 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 their, in their time. You know, Jewish writers disagree, but let's just go through this as quickly as we can. Up until the first century AD, the events were unrelated by Jewish writers. In fact, most Jewish writers saw Genesis 6, not Genesis 3, as the introduction of evil into the human race. They didn't have a concept of a fall. By the way, uh, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, I think, it, uh, I think there, it's noteworthy that if this is really a fall into moral guilt, if that's really the point of the passage, I'd like to know why Genesis 3 is never brought up again in the Hebrew Bible. I mean, nobody ever refers to it, but this idea, you know, really took, picked up speed uh, in Jewish circles. We're dealing with a loss of immortality. Again, that's, that's my own position rather than moral guilt. And it, it's, a, it's really apart from what we're doing here to talk about the, what constitutes the need of atonement, the need of redemption, and we can talk about that later. But again, there's a lack of an explicit connection. Um, you do have you know, some, some relationships here. Let's just describe a few. In 1 Enoch 69, uh, that text describes one of the angels this way. The third angel was named Gadriel. He it is who stowed, or showed the children of men all the blows of death and led astray Eve. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Led astray Eve. This Enoch names this one who led astray Eve Gadriel. What, what, what's with that? Show them weapons of death, so on and so forth. Elsewhere in the book of Enoch, the angel who taught humankind warfare was Azazel. And he has nothing to do with Eve. So the, the Jewish texts are going to disagree. They're just as confused uh, about the connection as, as you know, we still are today. There, there's just no certainty here. The discrepancy is an indication of the nature of the book of Enoch. Enoch itself is a composite uh, text. So is there a direct relationship or not? We don't necessarily... Uh, know that. However, we could say this. You could argue this kind of, this way. Since this text is the first to link the being who deceived Eve with the Genesis 6 episode, that text in Enoch, it's the first time you see them definitely linked. You have these two named, Gadriel Azazel, the well-known leader of the Washers to the Jewish readers, is put back into the garden as though he were the Nakash. So what they're doing here is they're they're looking at the Watcher story, and, and they're obviously, in Jewish thinking, are evil. And they think, well, you know, surely, you know, these guys are so bad. You, you could say maybe they're serpentine. In the Jewish mind, 
the mind of the people of the, uh, at Qumran, people in, in the intertestamental period, they thought, well, surely one of these guys, the, maybe the leader of the Watchers, was probably the, the being who caused Eve to fall. Uh, they're, they're, they're frankly just guessing here. But this is what they're believing, this is what they're saying. And in creating that link, the later writers also link the sexual sin of Genesis 6 with what happened between Eve and the serpent. I point this out because of people like Gardner. There's a reason why later rabbis came up with this idea that Eve fell. She's in a perfect environment. She's sinless. She fell, though, or she committed some atrocity. And, and, and they, they say that the only way to explain this is, is to have this third person, this third being, the serpent, the nakash, whatever, they began to argue and speculate, and soon their speculation became doctrine in some Jewish circles that Eve and the serpent had sex, cohabited, and then that was the fall. The text never says that. You never actually find a text that does, but again, they're, they're trying to understand, they're trying to link the two chapters. And Gardner and other Gnostic uh, Gnosticism has this, this view in its classic form. I've already been through this thing about Gardner, so I'm going to skip this here. He tries to prove that the Bible actually teaches this by quoting Genesis 4.1, which he quotes as saying, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Hava is Eve. Of course, the problem with that is he deletes two-thirds of the verse for his readers. He only quotes from here over. This part says, and she said, I have conceived a man, I have, I have obtained a man, et, which Gardner wants to translate with the Lord, like, he, like you know, she's having sex with the Lord. So not only does he delete the first two-thirds of the verse, but he also assumes that Yahweh here, the Lord, is the serpent, is Satan. Uh, again, he's, he's thinking in purely Gnostic terms here. Et, which is the arrow is pointing to, is a particle, and it can mean with, but it, most of the time it's silent. It marks the direct object in a sentence and is not even translated. But you have to tell by context, and unfortunate for you, if you're reading Gardner, he deletes the context for you. Here's the part of the verse he deletes. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man at from the Lord, not with the Lord, like you're having sex with the Lord, but she's saying, God's given me a son. It's very clear, the text is very clear. Adam is knowing Eve, very common sexual euphemism in the Hebrew Bible. So Gardner just deliberately misquotes the verse. But anyway, you have two options as far as the relationship of the seed of the Nakash. Remember, I will put enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman in Genesis 3. And sons of God. You can either have direct lineal children, direct genetic link, or a representative. And you know from my other session that I don't think the biblical text takes the first view. There's no text that says the serpent, the Nakash, actually fathered anything or anyone or any being. Okay, so the biblical view you're really driven to is that the seed of the Nakash is any being, divine or human, any evil doer who acts in agreement with the Nakash's purposes. And this is the way the Bible sort of uses the phrase. In Isaiah 14, 29, the stock of the snake, literally the root of the Nakash, is, again, speaking of Assyria, uh, and the next conqueror, Babylon. These are just evildoers who hate the people of God, and so they, they get associated with the serpent, with the Nakash. Phrases like, your father the devil, you brood of vipers, this is the way the, bi the biblical text uses the idea. And so the seed of the Nakash, I think, are just evildoers who oppose God's plan. Now in Genesis 6, you have the attempted corruption of the messianic line. The seed of the Nakash trying to do that. Remember the text in Jubilees that we quoted that specifically says, again, this isn't a Christian idea, this is a Jewish idea. The text in Jubilees that I had in Jubilees 5 specifically said that the reason that the watchers came down and cohabited with human women was to pollute them. Okay, just point blank. And that was the way that the Jews understood it. So again, recalling our discussion of the Nakash and the judgment of the rebellious divine being in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, one text in Enoch that may link that being to Genesis 6 as watchers thematically uh, you know, is that, that, that Jubilee text. Now, 
here's kind of a summary of where we're at. Both the Nakash and the original Watchers inhabit the abyss. You know, inhabit's kind of a generous word because they're in prison there. Both had humanity targeted for destruction. Both the Nakash and the second generation Watchers are described as serpentine. Both the Nakash and the second genera wa generation Watchers are free to roam the earth. If Watcher refers to throne guardians, both are spoken of in those terms too. Both have transformative powers in, in terms of being able to change their appearance. And again, an even tighter summary, the sons of, the God, sons of God and Watchers are the sons of the High God and have high standing in the council, but they become evil prior to the flood. There were 200 of them according to Enoch, at least one text. They father giants who are divine human hybrids, they inhabit the netherworld, and they're serpentine. Now the question is, what about the Anunnaki? Are any of those things associated with the Anunnaki? Is there a correlation between them and the Watchers, the sons of God? The name Anunnaki, let's start here. Contrary to what Sitchin says, the word Anunnaki does not mean they who from heaven came. He's, he's in the ballpark, but he wants the came part because he has the Anunnaki as ET gods from another planet. Rather, the word means the gods on high or princely offspring or seed. Now, I'm going to show you this. Again, I, I, I try to do this because I want you to know I'm not making it up. This is the current, the most current uh, Sumerian dictionary. Unfortunately, only the first three volumes are published. It's still in process. You ain't going to see it anytime soon. Because as I showed you with the other Chicago Assyrian dictionary, th these people must just be on something. <laughs> okay. Because they literally, when they construct a dictionary, they want to give you the word meaning, the, word, the possible word meanings, and they literally want to list every blasted tablet that the word occurs in. And that takes a lot of time. So I wish they wouldn't be so exacting, but I guess in some regards I'm glad that it is, that they are that way. This is the Sumerian Dictionary from the University of Pennsylvania. I, I went here for one of my degrees, and the, the project had been started by that time. This is the entry for Anunnaki. Now, Anunnaki, if, if you can make this out, generally means princely seed. Okay, and it, it's, also, it's used of people, you know, royal seed. So it just means you know, the offspring of, of you know, someone who's a king or kingly or royal. But it also does mean down here a group of gods, so it can mean either. But it doesn't mean they who from heaven came, i.e. in spaceships. <clears throat> Recall from the Nephilim lecture that the biblical sons of God are also the sons, sons of the Most High. Biblical sons of God are over the nations. They're called princes. Now, in their high estate, the Anunnaki acted as judges. They decree the fates. If you were here for the Panspermia lecture, I quoted Atrahasis, those who administer fates administer destinies. The Anunnaki then are divine judges. This is parallel to Psalm 82, where the sons of God were criticized for being bad judges. Same role, okay? So there's a point of correlation. In the Babylonian primeval epic of Atrahasis, all the gods of the divine council are referred to as the sons of Anu, now, Anu was the high god, so they're the sons of the high god, sons of the most high. Again, this is a correlation between the biblical sons of God and the Anunnaki. There are strong parallels here. As a sidebar, since the Anunnaki are the sons of Anu, the high god, they are completely divine in Mesopotamian religion. They are not hybrids. They are not the Nephilim. I don't know why, why, I do know why Sitchin does this, but it's just so, I mean, it's just a, a, a blunder. That's the only way I can describe it. I don't, he, he just wants this equation because he thinks this is, the, you know, coming down in rockets or something. Um, so he's wrong on linguistic grounds, not only, but he's also wrong in, in Mesopotamia. They're, they're completely divine. They're not, they're not hybrids, but that's a minor point. The Anunnaki, curiously enough, are demoted in Mesopotamian religion. In Mesopotamian texts, you actually have conflicting descriptions of the Anunnaki. Some texts have the Anunnaki as being gods of the highest rank under Anu, they're his sons. At the very, very beginning of Atrahasis, they're the gods who make the other gods, the Igigi, work and forced labor. 
This is all the more significant when you understand, again, Mesopotamian cosmography. And the main English source here is Horowitz, Mesopotamian Cosmic Geography. Uh, it, it's a great resource. Uh, he covers every term in, in, in every text in cuneiform that, is, that has to do with any part of the heavens or anything like that. It's, it's just a wonderful source. There are three levels, um, di you know, di different abodes, on high, earth, and the abyss. But in the Mesopotamian version, there were also three levels in heaven. Anu reigned in the highest level. The next tier down was the seat of Marduk, who was surrounded by the celestial gods. Part of this comes from Batero, religion in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, the Agigi. So the Anunnaki would have ranked higher than the Agigi with their father Anu. The lowest heaven was for the stars and the constellations. Now, at some point in Mesopotamian religion, and we are not told why, the Anunnaki were demoted. Eventually, they were consigned to the netherworld, believe it or not. Jean Batero, an expert, should be un, an expert in Mesopotamian religion, puts it this way. The Anunnaki were the most powerful, the most eminent, in some way the upper class and chiefs of others. At the very beginning of Atrahasis, these high-level gods make others work. Those who worked were the Agigi. Later, we aren't told why, the situation was reversed. And the latter represented the celestial gods, whereas the Anunnaki became the, became the gods who resided in the netherworld. They did something. For some reason, they were sent to hell, <laughs> you know, to be pretty blunt about it. They became known in later text as the infernal gods since they were sent to the lowest region of the netherworld where human ghosts stayed after death. Uh, the descent of Ishtar is where you'll find this phrasing. In the netherworld, the Anunnaki judged. So they, they still do the judging. They still do judging here. They judged the Etemu, or that's literally death spirit, to confirm each of the dead's entrance into the Mesopotamian netherworld and hell. Are you getting the, the picture here? Okay, we have beings who in, or in the Hebrew Bible inhabit the netherworld where the Rephaim are, the spirits of the dead, the bad place, and so on and so forth. Again, you have connections with the watchers who are consigned there. Even the second successive generations of watchers, according to Enoch, they're allowed to roam around on earth as demons, but they are also the inhabitants of the netherworld, of Sheol, of Tartarus, of hell. The number of the Anunnaki is interesting. Again, this is not an exact correlation, but it's just kind of... It's kind of interesting, so I throw it out here. The number of Anunnaki is inconsistent in Mesopotamian texts. One tradition has 600, in the netherworld, 300 in heaven. That's, there's the reference. So like the watchers, there are fallen and unfallen Anunnaki. Another tradition, believe it or not, has 200, which corresponds to the number of fallen watchers in at least one Enoch tradition. But since it's inconsistent, you shouldn't press the correspondence. Is there a sexual element with what the Anunnaki are or do? It's pretty obvious that the central concern in Genesis 6, 1 to 4 is the sexual cohabitation. Many scholars have argued there's no such thing in the Mesopotamian version, despite all the other parallels to the biblical account, between the accounts. But one cuneiform scholar has recently put forth a challenge to this idea. This is 2002, so this is a new article uh, from the Scandinavian Journal of the Old Testament. Kronvig... Uh, argues, and she's also, she also has produced a major work on uh, the roots of, of apocalyptic and, and uh, specifically apocalyptic literature in Enoch to Mesopotamia. So she's, she's certainly in the ballpark here with the kind of things we're thinking about. In the Atrahasis account of human creation, there's emphasis placed on the antediluvian, that means before the flood. The antediluvian humans brought about by a divine conception. Now, the divine conception here, you, you actually have the phrase, the sons of Anki. These beings, the sons of Anki, are considered a fusion of divine flesh and blood with clay. In Anki's speech, just prior to the creation of these people or beings, he utters a line that includes his, Anki's, interpretation of what's going to happen. He says, both God and man, let them be mixed together in clay. The very first line of Atrahasis has this theme as well, when the gods were human. It's a controversial phrase. Uh, some scholars, now not everybody, I'm going to be honest with you, says that the point of this phrase is this, that God and man are mixed. 
but they're, they're sort of interchanged. Although the Anunnaki are not the ones running the mixer uh, in Atrahasis, they're not the ones who actually, you know, again, I don't know why Sitchin says that they're the ones who do the genetic engineering. It's very clear that, that Nintu is doing this. The Anunnaki are just standing there watching. But Atrahasis has them approving the process and watching the outcome. The points. Atrahasis does, in fact, have hybridized human beings. Note the Nephilim are called men in Genesis, but they are half men, half divine, created by a god. So Atrahasis has hybridized human beings created by a god, in this case Nintu, with the approval of the sons of God, the sons of Anu. This action, since it results in a huge population increase, Genesis 6.1 also points to that, precipitates the flood. While the correlation is not complete, it is analogous at least. And finally, what about the serpentine features? Unfortunately, there's no direct evidence that the Anunnaki were serpentine in appearance. Some Sitchin supporters use the Ubayid figurines as proof of this, and here's one of them. Uh, the, these were found at the uh, at El Ubayid. Uh, you can look this up in a book on Mesopotamian art, which is where I got this picture here. It has some reptilian features to it, um, serpentine perhaps. Unfortunately, and you know, you, you, by now you know that it would, I would think it would be really neat if the Anunnaki were described as serpentine, but unfortunately none of these figurines have any inscriptions on them at all. We have no idea who, who the, the artist was depicting. He doesn't tell us. Uh, and there's no text that, that, that makes a serpentine connection with the Anunnaki. So it's just purely speculation or a guess to say, well, you know, this is what the Anunnaki look like. Well, you know, that's nice. Prove it. You know, there's just nothing that says that. But then again, the biblical sons of God and watchers prior to judgment aren't described that way either. We might take 4Q Amram as saying, this is what the, the second generation watchers look like, but, but that's only speculation as well. It's only after the original offenders are imprisoned, you know, the one text is 4Q Amram, that we actually read that description. But it does bring up an interesting possibility. The first few lines of Atrahasis have the number of the Anunnaki as seven. Again, another discrepancy with the nether numbers. There's all sorts of numbers here. Some deity lists of gods in the netherworld list a subgroup of gods that are associated with serpents or serpent demons. Now, this is all Mesopotamian stuff. There are seven such gods that are serpentine. So you see the number seven, seven. Maybe the seven gods, the seven Anunnaki, who are a subgroup of gods in the netherworld, maybe they're serpentine. Who knows? It's speculation. The article for this is Wiggerman, Trans-Tigridian Snake Gods in Sumerian Gods and Their Representations. Uh, again, it's just a speculative connection. So that is what I wanted to say about the Anunnaki. Let me conclude uh, with this. I think, I, I think what we can say with security is that it is very possible, it's very possible that, again, according to Jewish traditions, that the sons of God, the watchers, who cohabit with human women in Genesis 6 and in a whole bunch of other Jewish texts, it's possible that they could have had a serpentine appearance. We're not, we're, there's only one text that even suggests that. It's 4Q Amram, and it doesn't describe the Genesis 6 incident. It just says that the watcher who spoke to me looked this way. Uh, it's a weak correlation, but it nevertheless is there, so it's a possibility. And it is also possible that those beings who are condemned to inhabit the abyss and the netherworld, hell as we know it, and their offspring, the giants, the Rephaim, so on and so forth, who also wind up in hell, that they are the Anunnaki. I can't stand here and say that I, I think that correlation is tight. All I can say is that there's some analogous evidence for it. And we'll have to leave it at that. Let me close this. Are we going to take any Q&A or are we going to quit? What was that? It's totally up to you. They can raise the panel discussion now. Um, right. What time is it? 12 o'clock. Is Daryl here? Yes, he is. Okay. My druthers is to quit.
Okay, so write up your questions because I have a meeting with that guy right there. <laughs> Thanks a lot.